projections for both trade and gdp growth have been revised downwards by the international agencies these developments would have repercussions on india's trade and growth prospects as well another exter external risk stems from the volatility in oil prices particularly the likelihood of oil spiraling upwards if anything uh, untoward were to happen in an already turmoil ridden uh, middle east region uh, With the U.S. fleet sailing there and uh, Iran making various threats, it's an area of certainly of concern to India because we import significant amount of petroleum products from that region. On the domestic side, while we have seen several structural reforms in the recent years, a lot more needs to be done to address the challenges being faced today. One of the biggest concerns today relates to the consumption demand that has of late turned quite weak. With investment scenarios yet to see a turnaround, slowing consumption poses an even greater threat to the growth prospects of the Indian economy. The next government will have to plan for a robust reforms agenda that would not only boost consumer sentiment but also create conditions for higher private sector investment and exports. The priority of the new government should be to bring the economy back on a high growth trajectory. The five key areas that require immediate in attention include. reviving the agrarian and rural economy and supporting rural incomes creating an enabling environment to revive the animal spirits of our industry enhancing competitiveness of indian industry particularly export competitiveness through fiscal support and factor market reforms creating opportunities for greater employment and strengthening the financial sector specifically continuing the process of consolidating public sector banks and addressing the serious liquidity concerns especially those faced by the nbfc and corporates in today's world we would uh, like to hear your views and suggestions on these and other issues that confront the economy once again i welcome dr sujit bhalla and request him to address our members thank you thank you very much for inviting me to uh, give a talk right after the exit polls are out uh we really don't know uh which way they'll turn out though all of us have our biases and our expectations but i think the the topic and you know you covered the uh the areas extremely well um and these are exactly as it turns out what i'll talk about i might have a few additional uh points to make um but before i go into the indian side i want to point out <coughs> and talk about what's been happening in the world. I don't think it's been sufficiently recognized. Uh we obviously now uh quite involved with the global economy. Um and uh so no longer can we be isolationist or or unique. You know the <clears throat> India I've long maintained that one of the problems uh that uh, plagues the Indian economy and the Indian thinking is that we are unique and the problems we face are unique uh i think we should dispense with that notion because it leads to uh erroneous conclusions and i'll try and illustrate that uh with this <clears throat> so let me just point out what has been happening in the world not for the last year not for the last 5 years not since the global financial crisis which is the last 11 years but since at least 20 years and i would date it around the mid 90s first <clears throat> inflation is dead now we escaped the deadness of the inflation for the decade 2005 to 2014 but when i say dead it is that 
in the developed world, inflation has been somewhere around 2% per annum. When I went to graduate school, which was in the mid-70s, 2% um, was considered frictional inflation. Frictional. Okay? And this is the average inflation in the developed world for the last 25 years. And I think we need to recognize, and mind you, oil prices have gone up and down. Oil prices went, we forget, um, in 1998 or 1999, <coughs> oil prices were $10 a barrel. $10 and went up to $150 a barrel um, in 2008. And what happened to world inflation? It actually went down. Okay? Not by a large amount, but it went down because already at a low amount of 2%. So I think while we need to, and let's look at what happened in developing countries. Developing countries also saw a decline in median inflation, average inflation over this time period. A decline, despite, and including oil importing countries. We forget that between 98 and 2004, inflation in India averaged somewhere around 4% and would have been lower if not for the 9% onion inflation in 1999. So, first factoid we need to consider when we make policy in India is that the world inflation is now at 2% and developing countries at 3%. Inflation is not a topic for discussion. Policy in response to this low inflation is especially a topic for discussion, especially in a unique country called India, which I'll come to in a minute. <clears throat> the second factoid about the global economy is that except for about three or four years, 2004, 2007, world growth is down to about 3% annum, 3% per year with a little bit of fluctuation up, a little bit of fluctuation down, but very, very steady. As I said, in the 2004 to 2007, uh, it peaked at somewhere around 4.5 uh, to 5%, but otherwise it's been in the 3, 3.5% three range. Similar trends are there as far as the developing countries are concerned. Their mean growth has also come down as catch-up has occurred. And you know, <clears throat> While I'm on the story of catch-up, there is a rumor going around, um, especially uh, by my good friend Bertrand Roy, uh, my colleague, uh, my former colleague in the PMEAC, about the middle income trap. Now I find that the middle income trap is one of the most misunderstood economic concepts. Let me illustrate. Why do developing countries grow at a faster rate? Developing countries grow at a faster rate because they're much below the production possibility frontier and therefore movement to the production possibility frontier means their growth rate accelerates and the average growth rate accelerates. But as they approach and beyond a tipping point, and I think a lot of the countries, especially China, has crossed a tipping point, is that your growth rate naturally will go down because you're closer to the production possibility frontier. That means there's very little, you know the term low-hanging fruit, there's very little low-hanging fruit around. You have to work extra hard at getting that extra GDP growth. So therefore, <clears throat> I'm not worried at all that India is in the middle of a middle income trap um, because I think we have a lot of low-hanging fruit lying around, which I'll come to in a minute, which is because of our bad policies in the past is why we need to, we have this, if you will, um, opportunity to increase our growth rate. The last factoid about, and then I'll move to policies in India, the last factoid about world trade, <coughs> about the world economy, is world trade has fallen off a cliff. Until 2011, and this is in US dollars, until 2011, world trade was expanding at 10, 11, 12 percent per annum. We all benefited from it. Okay? World trade since 2012 has averaged 1 percent. 1 percent. It's gone up, it's gone down, but basically there isn't much prospect for world trade 
to grow much above five, six percent a year. Okay, measured in dollars. Now, if there's deflation in in real terms, it'll be larger because of deflation, and maybe uh, we can address that later. <clears throat> Last but not the least, for us and for the world economy is the U.S.'s attitude, tariffs with China. Um, as it happens, and this was related to the next subject that I'll come to regarding India, um, in my book, Devaluing to Prosperity, in 2012, I pointed out how China had taken undue advantage of the world economy, and I believe it's paying for its sins today, or paying for the extra advantage that it got earlier. <clears throat> this comes to, now I'll come to Indian policy. So basically, world growth, low. World trade growth, low. Inflation, low. Okay? And what are the options then, therefore, for the Indian economy, for Indian policymakers, as we approach a new government, uh, what can they do to address, and the same story with India. Actually, as far as Indian GDP growth rate is concerned, Give or take, you know, there were three years between 93 to 96 where we averaged 7% per annum. Then, for various reasons, perhaps we can discuss them, between 96 and 2003, we averaged something like 5, 5.5% per annum. After that, it's around 7% per annum. So, a lot of people say, listen, 7% is good, but that's actually quite an irrelevant uh, statement and conclusion because a country's GDP growth rate should be assessed in terms of its potential. You know, I remember when Greece was a major issue and people were saying that Greece is growing at 3% and the US is growing at 2%. Oh my God, and Germany is growing at 1.5%. They are doing fantastically, but it can't compare with a country which is below its potential. To your, to your growth rate, what you can compare with world growth as well as your potential growth. And our potential growth rate, no matter how you do the calculation, is somewhere around 8, 8.5% eight per annum. But I will show you why uh, that conclusion is well-founded. So, getting back to the value to prosperity and tariff falls, there is speculation, mega speculation, now I'm coming to Indian policies, etc. that all India needs to do, or a major part of what India needs to do, is to devalue. Some of it originates from uh, people around this uh, audience, some of it originates from esteemed economists and close friends of mine. Now listen, we have <coughs> really faltered in our export growth because of the fact that the exchange rate has appreciated. You must have read that many times and, and concluded by uh, various economists, etc. And indeed, as I mentioned, when I wrote the book Devaluing to Prosperity, the Devaluing to Prosperity came from the fact that your exchange rate was misaligned, that you undervalued your exchange rate, and therefore you will grow at a faster rate if you kept, if you kept your exchange rate undervalued. Two things or three things have happened since about 2008, 9, 10, is that the Indian rupee is no longer undervalued. And actually, Raghuram Rajan gave in his first Goenka lecture a big talk in Delhi stating that the rupee was not undervalued. So I find it somewhat both interesting and amusing that there are several scholars coming up with that this is the panacea, this is what uh, we need to do. In an analysis of <coughs> trade growth, export growth around the world, um, which Mr. Luther uh, was a member of the committee that I was involved in, which has looked at the possibilities, what we found was that the Indian real, the real exchange rate in India averaged something like 98 in the time period 96 to 2004-05, or 2010-11, and has averaged the same afterwards. So the real exchange, and this is the BIS, which is a comparative study. So there is zilch evidence to suggest that the Indian rupee 
uh, has been undervalued or that, and indeed there are many countries, Bangladesh, China, etc., whose real exchange rate has appreciated during that time and whose export performance has been much, much better than ours. So the first policy conclusion uh, for the new government, I would stress, forget about exchange rate devaluation for two reasons. One, it's not going to work. That is to say, it's not going to help you much. Second, the world is not going to allow you. By the world, I mean the major powers. Remember devaluing to prosperity? Remember China, U.S. tariff wars? They are not going to let any major, you know, if Singapore devalues its currency, you don't care. Okay. But a major economy devaluing its currency and keeping it uh, undervalued, people care about it and other countries care about it. So there are two reasons not to think of the exchange rate as an option. So what is, what can we expect or what should we demand that the new government do uh, once it takes power a few days from now. The first, you know, it, it's very interesting that my order of what they should do uh, is almost identical uh, to the order uh, presented. Agriculture. You know, how many of us have thought about the following fact? Every country in the world, every country in the world, that has reformed, every developing country in the world that has reformed, the first area of reform is agriculture. China, Malaysia, you take it, you think about it. Obviously we can't think of Hong Kong because there is no agriculture in Hong Kong. But really, and I, this is a, I want to sort of, uh, um, criticize all of us around this table. We had the great reforms of 1991, Nasuna Rao, Manmohan Singh. We had the continuation of the reforms by Mr. Bajpai, and we had a slight reversal of economic reforms under Manmohan Singh, uh, especially part two of uh, UPA. But how many of us have written that this is abominable? Agriculture is completely controlled. And how many of us have demanded, how many of you have demanded, how many of us, my colleagues have demanded, how many times I have demanded, that listen, please go ahead and address agriculture. What are the problems in agriculture? How many of you know that there is something called the Essential Commodities Act and there is something called the APMC? The APMC, Agriculture Produce Marketing Committee, states that a farmer can only sell through a mandi. He has to get a license to sell through a mandi. And you know, for a very brief moment, about a week or 10 days, uh, in October of last year, I was very thrilled because Fadnavis Chief Minister of Maharashtra came in and said he's abolishing the APMC. And I remember talking to, even in maybe a column or two, talking to others, India is really moving forward. And what happened? A week later, he revoked it. So I think this is where despair is, that a week later he revoked it, and this is where hope is. Because who is interested in keeping the APMC? Large farmers, politicians, middlemen. Do not mistake, this is a powerful industry, powerful interest group that has prevented these reforms even being discussed for the last 30 years, for the first half. Then how I, uh, further, we moved backwards. How we move backwards hurting the farmer? We talk about farmer distress. How many people attribute farmer distress to our completely abominable minimum support price policy? How many? How many do we go out and protest? Oh, we do it in the name of the poor. Therefore, we all expected to applaud it. Oh, we're doing it for the poor. How many poor farmers 
benefit from the MSP. And you know, the best thing that's happened to the Indian economy is these guys, <clears throat> the present government, took their cues from the Swaminathan Committee, who's a geneticist, and whose policy that they adopted that the minimum support price or the whatever would be 50% above. Are they buying? And what happened? Farm prices didn't go up. Instead, everybody's talking about farmer distress. Correctly, sir. Because this thing, the minimum support price, only helps the large farmers completely misdirects allocation of water, fertilizer, scarce resources, and misplaced profits. Why should Punjab be growing any rice? And why should Maharashtra be growing any sugarcane? We need to address it. And you as captains of industry, and agriculture is also an industry, need to come out very forcefully on this issue. So what is the policy measure needed? Very simple. <clears throat> Literally very simple. That there be zero, zero intervention in agriculture. You can buy what you want, you can sell what you want, you can import what you want, you can export what you want. This will not give you, necessarily, and most likely not, give you a desirable distribution of income. May not. It may, it may not. Assume for a moment that it won't, which is a reasonable assumption. This is where direct benefit transfers and income support comes in. You know, we had a chance at income support a couple of years back, three years back, and I think my good friend Arvind Subramaniam messed it up by calling it universal basic income, which is an idea about as nonsensical as it gets. But the core of the idea that basically you need to transfer incomes, not through in-kind subsidies, not through food, but through cash, through income. No intervention in agriculture, no MSPs, no FCI, no food distribution PDS, another albatross hanging around our neck, for the last 45 years, but income support. And that allows us to, given the global economy as the way it is, of increasing our agricultural growth rate from something like 3%. It's averaged 3 and 3.5% 3 for 70 years. We've had the Green Revolution, we've had the Red Revolution, we've had the White Revolution, and our agricultural growth is stuck at 3%. This is the reason. We've got too much intervention in by the government in agriculture. It's doing the things it should not be doing and not doing the things it should be doing. And I think the time has come for it to uh, come ahead and address this. So that's the first. Second, <clears throat> or this is the third, exchange rate, don't bother about it. Uh, let it appreciate if it appreciates, depreciate if it depreciates, but basically not much give there. Huge give from uh, agriculture. And then I come to, and you know, I remember saying this in this audience since, well, it's forever actually, uh, 1998, 99, many of you have uh, heard me then, and many of my friends accuse me of being a, a one item man, which is interest rates. The cost of capital is insanely high in India. And I remember to this audience saying, there's a wonder that the industrial growth in India is 6-7% per annum. Because we face, we and you face in industry, the highest corporate taxes rate in the world, and I'll come to that in a minute, the highest cost of capital in the world, and the worst labor laws in the world. And this is really, we don't have to go much further than look at this. And you know, and I have to, uh, I remember with Dilip at a meeting a year ago or something, the Fiki meeting, and we had this discussion on interest rates. I've been, you know, please, you know, I can't, 
Here is, is about a year, year and a half ago, and we've got the leading economists in India, the leading economists in India, sitting around the table, and I pointed out that we had the highest cost of capital in the world in terms of the repo rate of the RBI, which has been on a misguided path for uh, certainly the last five to six years. Um, and <clears throat> that you can't expect investment to take off as well as growth to take off if you have this cost of capital. No country has been able to do it. No country in the world has been able to accelerate its GDP growth on the basis of increasing the real cost of capital. And Dilip, you will remember, there were several esteemed economists sitting around the table arguing that no, either the cost of capital doesn't matter, or that, uh, and literally they said, doesn't matter, so in which case I said, why don't we raise the repo rate? And to which they never have a response, because they haven't thought it out. I really, I, I want to condemn in as strong terms as possible my colleagues, economists, who argue that the cost of capital in India doesn't matter. And there are lots of them. Okay? Lots of them. You read them in the papers. I think now that the government has changed, uh, a new government will come in, some of this may go down. Because I, my personal feeling, there was a political economy uh, to, the, uh, to the allegation, not the allegation, to the uh, recommendation that interest rates be high, because interest rates high means hurt the economy, hurts the economy means the BJP government will lose and the old elite will come back. That's my political economy argument. But nevertheless, the fact remains one of the key things. And when I say the cost of capital, obviously it means the quantity of capital as well. And it means the removal of restrictions for people to access capital. But really, it's insane for a developing economy, lower middle economy, to have the highest real repo rates in the world. This is insane. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a diplomatic word to address this policy. So this is something that the government needs to address. You ask for what is it that they need to do, um, and I'm op optimistic on this as well. Corporate taxes. Study after study after study has shown that the high, and this is not done by me, and the Indians don't, you know, we believe our tax rates are too low or whatever, I, I don't know. Uh, but let me give you studies done by international scholars. Um, India has the second highest effective tax, corporate tax rate in the world. Let me make that clear. The corporate tax rate in India is 30, and after you have your your surcharges and uh, the rest of it, uh, it's about 33 and cesses, which is another policy measure while I'm on it, that cesses do not have a place uh, in a modern economy. It's not transparent and it is uh, uh, basically unfair. But <clears throat> let me come to, the, so we have something like a nominal tax rate, corporate tax rate of 32 and a half, 33 percent. And the effective tax rate, which is the taxes paid by corporates as a ratio of their profits, is 24.5% in India. Most of, if not all of our competitors, are somewhere in the 15 to 20% range. 15 to 20. Okay? The U.S. has just got there two years ago, and we've seen the effects it's had on the U.S. economy. And we go around saying... No, 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 we need to increase taxes, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poor, and all the rest of the nonsense that we keep hearing about. But we need to get real. We need to, you know, we're part of the world. Competition means competing with your neighbors. Let me give you an illustration of how deeply it affects us. In 2010, China decided to move up the value-added scale. And I remember all of us, must be Dilip, myself, all the other economists said, aha, this is a chance for Indian textiles to take off. I'm sure Rajiv thought the same. Right? This is big time for Indian exports, especially textile exports. China is vacating and India has a natural 
historical compared advantage in uh, textiles, and we should uh, be able to occupy that space. What happened? Bangladesh stole our lunch, and Vietnam stole our dinner, and maybe some other countries stole, Sri Lanka stole our breakfast. And why? Two reasons. First, let me give you on corporate taxes. You know, the World Bank has the ease of doing business, and this government correctly identified um, that ease of doing business was uh, uh, something that we have to really, really improve on. And they have improved on it. But one of the things, as part of the ease of doing business chapter or data that the World Bank provides from 2006 for every country in the world is a section 7 and several subsections in there which has to do with <coughs> taxes and tax payments, etc. They provide a ratio which is that after payment of wages and social security and taxes, what is the percentage of profits retained by a firm, by an average firm? In India, throughout this time period, is 38%. In Vietnam, Bangladesh, etc., it's 62-64%. And here we're talking about, oh, we should change our exchange rates. You know, I mean, your exchange rate is going to give you a diddly score. And whereas a change in your tax rates is really going to benefit. So that's why uh, textile exports didn't go on anywhere. Another major reason why the textile exports and other exports and the Indian economy is our labor laws. You know, we had these labor laws, first of all, uh, you know, again, Rajiv knows this much better than anybody else, but I, I don't know, when did England give away on their labor laws? Must have been sometime in the 19th century. Okay. We have moved from a very, very poor economy with 80-90% of the people as absolutely poor to a middle, lower middle income economy with maybe less than 5-6% of the poor. 5 or 6 percent of the population is poor as defined according to the Tendulka poverty line. And we have the same labor laws. That is, we are still, you know, engaging in Marx, you know, one of the most interesting results coming out from this election is that, I think, so let me just take diversion, is that, you know, the Communist Party in India may not reach double digits. And we're still fighting the same old battles and same old arguments about labor laws. Now, a large part, what I've consistently said, and I'll say it again, that, you know, what is preventing, or has prevented labor laws from being reformed in India is because there is this unholy square cubed alliance between the Swadeshi Jagran Munch of the RSS the CPM and the Sonia led wing, Sonia Gandhi led wing of the Congress Party. They believe in keeping these labor laws. And there were major stalwarts in the BJP government who believed, and I've had arguments with them, in keeping the labor laws. So I think one of the first tasks for the government is to begin to reform the labor laws. And free it open. You know, I mean, I, I just don't understand how you can co-opt, you can buy out those people who are presently under the union umbrella or under the labor laws umbrella. After that, how does it hurt? Who does it hurt? Wages go up, profits go up. You please explain to me how is it that we've continued with this policy and there's no country in the world that has done so. But as I started off by saying, we are unique. You know, India, the incomparable. And I think the time has come. It's not the case. You, you want to be incomparable, then stay incomparable and stay relative to your potential poor for a long, long time. Okay, <clears throat> what else is there? One last 
point, and I think I've covered uh, most of them, is animal husbandry and cow politics. You know, <clears throat> if you look at, I mean, my one of my major complaints at farmer distress uh, in my travels, in my analysis, etc., um, is that this anti-Muslim uh, policy uh, called the banning of cow slaughter has been attributed uh, to the present government. And, and I think it's despicable. I think this policy needs to go. It's really hurting the poor. It's hurting the economy. It's hurting India. And it's hurting the Muslims the most. Let's look at the origins of this policy. In 1959, this is under the Congress regime, since it's we related to politics, that's why I'm bringing this in. When Nehru was a leader, oh, let's go back a bit, sorry. It's in the directive principles of your constitution. So if I had, if anybody were to listen to me, one of the first things I would do, recommend, to the government, and Bajpai tried to do that in 2003-2004, is to assemble the experts to rewrite the constitution. The Indian constitution is all about state rights and nothing about individual rights. And, sorry, it's all about state rights, animal rights, and cow rights. Now, you know, I mean, it should have been there in the first place in 1947. Why is it there today? So let me explain to you the cow rights in the Constitution. Directive principles, so 59, the Supreme Court passes a law saying a cow above the age of 14, uh, below the age of 14, could not be slaughtered. Okay. Sure. So. Then in 2005, again, when uh, the Congress was in power, and I know your next session is with the judiciary, etc. Maybe you should ask them about the relationship between politics and uh, rights and governments and the Supreme Court. But essentially what happened in 2005 in a, I think it was seven judge um, committee or nine or whatever, nine, seven, seven, which is unusual. They wrote, I mean, it's one of the most amusing things, and tragically amusing. They wrote in this thing, judgment, that complete ban on cow slaughter. Long before, so first, long before the BJP was born, before any of us were born, you had the, the, your, your, your Hindu constitution directing you to say that we have to preserve the cow. Second, you had the Congress government 1959, and now in this judgment, complete ban on cows. And you know what? There is, and Dilip, you should read this, and economists, etc. There is an extended discussion about the economic value of a cow because of dung. I mean, in the Supreme Court judgment, are they, they're both valuable here. You have a dung here. And they give you how much dung is collected. On the, from the cow. So I think, you know, in my view, this, <clears throat> again, animal husbandry uh, is a very, very important component of our agriculture policy. And I think we need to look anew at this policy so that um, I, for one, don't believe, and, you know, I just visited UP, etc., and there were several people correctly stating, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, aside, doesn't matter. Anyway, you know, I have to take food for my child and feed it to the cow. Now, one interesting policy result of this, do the following calculation, which I've done uh, in my book, uh, Citizen Raj, is that the government announced, what was a very good policy in my view, it was, it, and it should be extended uh, to all farmers and, and to all poor people, the direct transfer policy, which they now have, is 6,000 uh, rupees per farm or per farm family a year. Do the math. 
There are about 8 million, 10 million thousand, I've got the numbers in my book, that are above the age of giving milk. That is, they are useless. It costs about 60 rupees, 40 to 60 rupees, for upkeep of a cow, feeding it. Multiply the number of cows with the upkeep of the quiet, and you get exactly, exactly 72,000 crores. Okay? So, number one. So I think, now I'll conclude. I think there's been, been, while I've been critical of the Indian economy, and critical about uh, the politics, let me now conclude with and what has needed with what has happened over the last five years, and which I think is related to the election result. I've been studying and writing about poverty and income inequality, etc., for too long to mention. And many academic artists, etc. And you know, we there are various uh, there are various sort of uh, descriptions of this policy. Uh, in the name of the poor, you may have it, or poor poor growth, or inclusive growth, uh, which was the latest addition to this policy. The most inclusive growth that any country has seen over a sustained period of four to five years has been seen in India under the Modi government. Do the analysis. Okay? So, as I said, farmer distress is a mega problem. <clears throat> you have the cows is a mega problem. On the other side, as part of inclusive growth, are the chulas, are the toilets, is money for housing and infrastructure, road building, etc. Which is, road building is one of the most important components of inclusive growth. So we have done well, but not good enough. And in order to compete in this world, we need to change some of our most basic policies, assumptions, which have held us back for the last 70 years, and which hopefully will not hold us back anymore. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, articulate speech. I think uh, all the points which industry likes, and if it were to f up to Fiki, we would make you the finance minister of the country. A lot of our problems would be solved. But, uh, you know, what you said, we cannot uh, dispute any of it, particularly the last point, which I think is not written in the press at all, but it's a cause for pain for people who own those cows. Uh, we'll now, we have a few minutes and we'll open it up to question and answers. So, anybody wants to ask uh, Mr. Balla? Yes. Assuming that the exit polls are correct and the uh, NDA cruises to 300 plus seats, uh, despite the agrarian distress, despite the high employment rate, despite the economy slowing down and everything, what incentive will the new government have to carry out any of the reforms that you have mentioned? Thank you. Would you like to answer that? Yeah. Take a few. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, no, very, uh, you know, uh, I think it also, a very good question, um, and also underlies what I think how uh, if, if the opinion polls are right, if the exit polls are yeah. right, how, how people have got it so wrong. Um, and that's what it uh, illustrates. I think the idea that this government, like many governments in the past, uh, is similar to them, that they are doing it for a, a political goal, I think is erroneous. Um, think about it this way. Maybe they're doing it, they need to put out these policies and they need a majority in order to pursue. So the causality, I think, might very well go the other way. That's my prediction. And we'll find out. We'll find out soon enough. But that is my prediction. I think, you know, Prime Minister Modi needs to be looked at as a, in my view, and I know 
many will disagree, etc. Uh, as a visionary, and in the same league as Lee Kuan Yew, I mean, people have tried to compare him to various other leaders and so on and so forth. I think the one, uh, one leader, world leader, that he's most comparable to is Lee Kuan Yew. So he has a mi mission. Uh, he has a vision and a mission. And I think getting a majority is very much part of that mission. So, but the proof will be, so I think the last five years, as I said, if you're in the bottom 70% of the population, you've never had it so good. It's not as good as you should be having. That's why I mentioned the problems with the cows and everything else. It's not as if everybody has reached Nirvana or even anywhere close to it. But you look at the progress. You know, one of the things I found out, in, you know, I, I went to Karnataka last year, then Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, UP, West Bengal. No, they, they will be critical. You know, there isn't this fear that we talk about in the, in the newspapers and so on and so forth. You know, they're actively telling you, disagreeing uh, with the government and saying where they've been hurt and saying where they benefit. And one of the things coming out is we've never seen delivery of social services. 50% of the PDS, not for one year, not for two years, for 40, 77, 23, 40 years has disappeared into thin air. Oh, I'm going back home. Are they food security? 50% in thin air means corruption. So I think if there's one person who can address this evil part of our public policy, it is Modi. And he needs a majority to do so. Mr. Vaiki Modi. Uh, my question is, you sit on uh, the exit poll, etc. quite often I hear you. So what is your prediction going to <laughs> <laughs> What is going to happen on 23rd? I'm taking your, what is your gut feel? My predictions are all contained in this. Um, I had said about two months ago, two and a half months ago, which is all there in black and white, uh, that the BJP will get 274 seats on its own and that the Congress will get 57 seats on its own. And in the article for which I have to leave this, um, coming out tomorrow, um, I am, uh, you know, the first line of my article says, my colleague Dal Rama said he's got the exit polls right. I have. Now the important thing is to get the actual uh, event right. And the number which you'll see in the paper tomorrow is that the BJP gets on its own 294 and the Congress gets somewhere, somewhere around 44. Mr. Saraf. I think thank you very much for identifying the problem that we are unique. And therefore we have to have a different legal system, different financial system to tackle our problem. But I think that's the problem with across judiciary, across bureaucracy. So what are your mantras to move things, things out? out this is a central problem. Yeah, well, no, I, I, I hate to say, say I think the mantras are based on simple and I would cut if I were if wishes were horses and Sandeep was right. Now, what I would, I would cut corporate taxes by about 500 basis points immediately across the board. And you know, <clears throat> and you, you get the, not the sense, the reality that the government is moving in that direction, but they've reduced it for the bottom 95% or something which account for 20% or less, yes. or maybe. so. That's the first policy measure. I would free up agriculture. I would expand the income support system and have a three-year phase program where we don't have the PDS anymore. I mean, uh, and oh, I would, you know, we know the central bank is independent, but and all the rest of it, I would try and knock some sense into them that we can't afford to have a real interest rate of somewhere around three and a half percent. And accompanying that with credit, NBFCs, all these problems, you know, they are related, but the policy measures are hitting you in the face, what you should be doing. So the big question, political economy question, why haven't we done it? I think that's the story. 
of, of India throughout is that none of the solutions that I've given are either original to me, definitely not, and they've been known for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Baki dunya ne kiya, humne ne kiya. So humne puchna chahiye, kyo ne kiya humne? Mr. Khitan, NG. Labor reforms. So the labor is a concurrent list. And uh, we find that lately there is a lot of competition within the states. And we lately saw that two states, particularly the state of Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh, they made a lot of changes in the labor law. So therefore, on one hand, to ask central government to do the changes in the labor law, on the other hand, you know, we can ask the states to change the labor law because that's the easier way to do things. You know. I, I think, look, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, even when you didn't have a majority government, uh, the central government can have a lot of influence, by example. And now, more to exactly the point you're making, that given that the BJP government rules most of the states, that if they don't do it, they have no excuses. You know, one of the things, especially if they get anywhere close to 294 or whatever uh, seats, majority, you don't need the extra, uh, they have no excuses left. None. For precisely the reason that you're saying. So, Mr. Panda. Um, there's been a lot of focus on, obviously, on the exit polls and, uh, you know, whatever the numbers work out, it does does look like the NDA is back and with a, definitely more than just a workable majority. But in, in all of this and with the, with reference to reforms and other governance measures going ahead, uh, how much of a hurdle do you see the lack of a majority in Rajya Sabha to be and, and how to overcome that? Well, <coughs> we'll be good. I, you know, I think... There was a time when you needed, for example, for GST, which is another one, another one of the low-hanging fruits that we can reform it. I think it's a great tax, uh, but they made it too complicated, etc. You know the reason. So, um, for that, you needed a workable majority in the Rajya Sabha. Um, so, if you're not changing the constitution, you don't need it. Labor laws, I'm not so sure. I mean, I would draft Rajiv and to look at whatever can be done outside. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think it's not that, you know, plus guidance, that's what leadership is. The, the leadership means that you guide the country um, for the states to do the question that was asked, for the states to do the right thing or to move along. Uh, take, for example, on the PDS, etc., that they are union territories that are explicitly under uh, the government, under the central government. You can, and they have tried to start, and there's a whole political economy story on that. So, uh, summarizing, I don't think it's as much of a hurdle as uh, it's been made out to be or as one thinks, um, and it shouldn't be. Plus, what you'll get, um, let's see what happens in Madhya Pradesh, let's see what happens in Karnataka. <laughs> so, uh, the, um, you know, and there's a lag effect anyway. But I, I think uh, in, the, in the scale of problems that we have, um, I think these simple measures that the government can take will go along. That will help on the land, which is another, sorry, I, I should have mentioned, I think that's what you may be alluding to. That is a, a gain uh, by leadership we can move towards uh, and surmount that. Hurdle. Thank you, Sajid, for involving me everything from labor to taxes to everything else very easy to do. But Mohit, you didn't finish Mohit's question. And this is, so this is not a new question. Mohit asked about bureaucracy and judiciary. You didn't talk about judiciary at all since we have a judge coming in now. Here's your chance. No, no, I, uh, far be it for me to talk about the judiciary with you coming, with you there. And, uh, no, I, okay, I, I'll give you my honest, um, I think, the, you know, I, the Supreme Court and, how, can, how do I phrase it? I think it's a mega problem area, our judicial system, mega. And uh, the way that judges get appointed, the tenures, I, you know, there was this, I'm trying to remember, 
uh, Ms. Banerjee uh, on this uh, mem that, uh, you know, uh, I think the, the judge's name is Banerjee on this uh, mem on uh, Mamta, on Mamta. And she said, you know, you have to apologize. I mean, this is a Supreme Court judge saying you have to apologize. Because if your, I'll, I'll give you the quote, now I remember it. Your liberty only extends as far as it doesn't affect, you know, they all try it out, dusted, you know, are they, yeah. and as, as long as it doesn't offend somebody. So I think mega, I mean, you should ask your next guest, I mean, how abominable. So. On that note, may I ask our senior VP, Anita, to please deliver a formal vote of thanks. Mr. Bala, on behalf of the entire NECM and all of us gathered here, let me first say uh, a very heartfelt thank you. It was insightful, it was incredibly direct and yet extremely deep. And, uh, you know, you went across a range of things. I think uh, many things will truly stick in our head. Inflation is dead, uh, production possibility frontier as a way of really looking at the, the uh, GDP growth and not uh, being satisfied. Uh, I was particularly struck by one thing is that in today's steering committee meeting, we actually were discussing what do we take forward to the government and like uh, you rightly observed, Sandeep had said some of that, but one of the important things that we spoke about was really not just the ease of doing business, but the cost of doing business. And that encompasses uh, your points on cost of capital, uh, your very direct and insightful comments on cost of labor, and, and a range of others. So while I think we are neither in the position nor have the privilege or the authority to request you to be finance minister, on behalf of FICI, we clearly uh, would request you to continue to be our advisor. Because as we move forward in being the voice of industry, I think it's important for us in a very complex agenda and a seemingly unique uh, environment, it's important for us to learn global lessons, yet steer our economy in whichever way we can be of influence. So we thank you for this afternoon and thank you in an anticipation that we will continue to have many sessions uh, with the committee's request for some, of, some more of your time. And one thing I think we all promise, we're all going to be reading the book. So I think that's what everyone So thank you all very much.